So already we're doing better than we did this morning because I told them to turn to Matthew 15 and then realised uh, that was not the passage. I had that uh, in my mind for some reason. So 1 Samuel 15 is where we're looking. And uh, one very important um, ministry point that the Lord has for us today in this. And it's looking at Saul. And from verse 1 we have uh, these words in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men and women, children, infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them to lay 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine and he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites that I don't destroy you along with them for you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites and then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. And as he was told, but he was told rather, Saul's gone to Carmel. There he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, well, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, well, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop! Samuel said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission. The Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. I brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, but in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you as king. And then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. And I violated the Lord's commands and your instructions. I was afraid of the people. And so I gave in to them. Father, we pray and ask, O oh God, that you would powerfully, Lord, minister this word to us, to me as much as anybody. Father, we pray that you'll give us ears to hear and uh, hearts, Lord, to receive what your word is saying. And give us, Father, a, a mind, Lord, that uh, has understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
There are those in the scripture that God gives us for our instruction, whether that's encouragement, those who, uh, despite all odds, trusted in the Lord, and the Lord proved what he would do through them, whether that's Noah, Abraham, whether it's someone like Ruth and Naomi, whether it's the prophets, the apostles, there are plenty in the scriptures there that uh, whose example <coughs> inspire us to put our lot with Jesus and to trust him completely. But in the scriptures, there are also those individuals that God has deliberately put there as warnings. These are the examples to avoid. These are the people who did not inspire and encourage us to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And people like Esau who swapped his birthright for a bowl of bean soup. Or someone like Cain, who not only was the first murderer that we read about, but was also the first one where, where God actually described the nature of sin and said, sin is crouching at your door. It desires you or to master you, but you must master it. Or someone like Judas, who betrayed, of course, Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and he's not the last to betray Jesus and Jesus' purpose over someone's life in order to pursue money. Well, today we've got Saul. And Saul is by far one of the great examples of not what to do with the Lord. And uh, he's one of what I would call God's could have been champions. He's one of those that could have gone far if for some, if not for some uh, standout examples of rejecting the word of the Lord. And if you want to summarise Saul's life, the word loss is a fair word. Uh, we find that Saul uh, had the privilege of being the first monarch, the first king over Israel. Uh, Samuel was the last judge in that uh, dark period of Israel, 330 years. And that was coming to a close and now instead of a, a warrior leader, which is what a judge was, uh, now they were going to have a king because they wanted to be like everybody else, if you remember that, in 1 Samuel 12. And uh, so they have Saul, who was head and shoulders above everybody else. He came from the, the smallest uh, tribe, Benjamin, and the least clan within Benjamin. So he was the weakest. And so when they went to proclaim him king, there he was, full of courage, hiding amongst the baggage, uh, hoping not to be found. And they found him and made him king. And yet we find in chapter 13 that Saul loses the promise of having a continual kingship. That goes to David, a man after God's heart. And we find that because Saul rejected uh, waiting for Samuel to offer sacrifice. He did that instead because he saw his men were fleeing in panic because of the Philistines. And uh, when Saul looked at his watch as he had in those days, Samuel hadn't arrived on time and thought, I better take matters in my own hands. Chapter 14, he loses the respect of his army. Chapter 15 now, he loses two things. One is that he loses the legitimacy of the kingship. The Lord has rejected him as king. And the next chapter, he's going to tell Samuel, go and anoint one of the sons of Jesse, and that will be David, a king after his own heart. But even more than losing the legitimacy of the kingship, he loses the presence of God. God rejects him and does that in a powerful way by where it says that Samuel left for Ramah and had uh, no further discourse with Saul until right at the end where he's summoned up by the witch of uh, Endor. And you read about that. And uh, again, it's to pronounce judgment over Saul. But in a very powerful way, you see this exodus of the presence of God from Saul. He's going to find a king that's going to do his express bidding. Well, how did it come to this? And what is it that God has to say to you and to me in 2021? Well, the context is that uh, Samuel comes to Saul and here is one last opportunity that Saul has to get it right. He can still turn things around by doing the express bidding of God. 
in 1 Samuel 15. But Samuel comes to him and gives him perhaps the, the, the heaviest, most sobering command that a king can receive, and that is you are going to make a holy war against a culture. Now we use the word holy because in this sense it is a culture that is set apart, which is what holy means. It is set apart for complete annihilation. To think that a culture can become so wicked and so bad before the eyes of God that he says everything that breathes in that culture, in that city, must die. The cattle, everybody. Because uh, judgment and guilt has come upon them. It is also holy in that this is not something that Saul dreams up. This is God's express command to him that these people are set apart as a sacrifice for destruction and you will be my hammer, Saul, to go and bring this about. This isn't the first time that this has happened. Of course, the flood would be the, the biggest demonstration of this, where again, God was grieved this time that he ever made man, let alone making Saul king. And everything that breathed died, except for Noah and his family and the animals within the ark. You see this with Sodom and Gomorrah. God again in judgment wiped out that wicked culture. Jericho, when they were to take the promised land, they took it because the Canaanites and the Amorites were so wicked and God had given them 400 years to repent. He said that to Abraham. And through Joshua, now the conquest would happen. But with Jericho, that city was devoted to complete destruction and nothing was to be taken. And yet you remember one soldier did, a guy called Achan. Just took some clothing and a little wedge of silver and some things for himself and brought sin upon the entire army because that was devoted to destruction. Well, now you've got the same thing happening here with this group of people called the Amalekites. And they have a, a, a terrorist history when it comes to Israel. They're a, a nomadic tribe in the northern Sinai Peninsula. And we read about them in uh, uh, Exodus 17, where they've Exodus generation have come through the Red Sea. And you see all this in your um, invisible map, don't you? And uh, they're going down the Sinai Peninsula towards Mount Sinai, and the Amalekites come and do some raiding. They need plunder, they need supplies, and so they pick off the weakest, those that were lagging behind, women, children, the elderly. They take livestock, they take things for themselves. And that's the chapter, Exodus 17, where Joshua goes to fight the Amalekites, and Moses is up, up on top of the, the hill. And while the, the staff was up in his hands, the Israelites were winning. When his arms got heavy, the Amalekites were winning. And that great intercessory work and where Israel learned it was only through the strength of God, not the strength of her army. In Judges 6, which is the chapter where Gideon is called to be a judge, we find that the Amalekites, together with the Midianites, come and slaughter all of the livestock of a particular a uh, group of Israelites there, they spared nothing and again plunder their uh, store of food. And so in Deuteronomy 25, in those final few days of Moses' life, Moses says this, he says, When the Lord gives you rest in the promised land, then you shall blot out the name of Amalek under heaven. Don't forget, Amalek, by the by, was a grandson of Esau. And there, uh, of course, is, is the seeds of uh, a lot of spiritual fight that goes on between the, the sons of Esau and the sons of Jacob. And uh, one of the descendants of Abimelech, or Agag, was a certain man called Haman. And you remember Haman the Agagite, who uh, went to destroy the Jews in the book of Esther. And again, you have this struggle of Esau and Jacob fighting. Well, you've got that declaration where the Lord says, once you're settled in the promised land, you're going to wipe them out. 385 years later is 1 Samuel 15. Now is the time. Plenty of time for people to repent. We're flat out uh, 385 seconds of patience, aren't we, with people. God does 385 years. Nothing has changed. 
So wicked are they that they are set for annihilation. There is one further command that God gives, and this is vital to understanding the story. Because they are given over to judgment, there is no plundering here. One of the perks of being a soldier, aside from staying alive, was that if you won, you got to plunder the enemy. That's where you really made your money. The clothing, the fine jewels, the rings that were on the finger, um, their livestock, you took cities, you helped yourself. Uh, you know, th there was a lot to be made if, if, as a soldier if you kept winning, of course. But not in this circumstance. You were very much the hammer of God. There's no plundering. The blessing is that you did the express obedience of God and he would make it up. But they were to be God's hammer of judgment and nothing more. So Saul gets together an army, 210,000. Now you'd be thinking the odds are pretty good for you, 210,000. And he warns as they go to the city of Amalek, a group of people called the Kenites and says, look, it'd be good for you if you moved out of the way. And he says to them, we will spare you because you did kindness to that Exodus generation. You welcomed them. You did the opposite that the Amalekites did. So the Kenites up and move, as you would, and Saul and army go to war. And it says very clearly, they almost did everything. If it breathed, it died, except, except they spared Agag, the king, and they spared the best of the livestock, the fatted calves, the lambs, the sheep. These, it says, they were unwilling to destroy. Now, why would you do this? For two reasons. The first is that Saul knows that there's a lot of political mileage to be made with Agag. All right, Saul's got to make up a bit of PR. He needs some good publicity, as a lot of politicians know. He's lost the respect of his men in the previous chapter. That gets spread throughout the country. So he needs some good PR. What better PR for a king than to say, I am the guy who defeated the Amalekites who gave us so much trouble in the infancy of our nationhood, whom you read about and that Moses predicted you will destroy them. I'm the man. Saul. The Agag conqueror. And to parade this prisoner in certain towns of influence, Carmel being one, uh, where you had a, a lot of wealthy aristocracy, and you needed to curry favour, you needed good political connections, nothing much has changed over the centuries, they needed them back then. And uh, so he made a monument for his honour, not at Mount Carmel up the top, but at Carmel, a town that was about 40k south of Jerusalem and so he does that the second reason why they spared the best of the cattle and the sheep and so on and remember it's the men who said this and Saul acquiesces because again he needs to curry favor with his men he needs to get them back on side and uh, you know they probably deserve a bit of loot and plunder after all but they're going to sacrifice them and have a big celebration sacrifice at a town called Gilgal. Gilgal is one of the three towns where Samuel did his judging. It is also the town where Saul was formally recognized as king over Israel. It was also a place of sacrifice and worship so it would make sense to do it in a town like that. Again it had a lot of significance for Saul. He had everything to win and to gain in doing these two things. And let's face it, in his view, we're going to be fulfilling the word of the Lord because the Lord said destroy them. So that's what we will do. We just won't do it at Amalek. We'll do it at Gilgal, but they will still be destroyed in his view. So Saul is absolutely convinced that even though he sort of temporarily hit the pause button on the mission, nonetheless, the mission will be done. And the Lord will be happy. 
And he feels as such when he sees Samuel coming over the hill. And he says, uh, Samuel, the Lord bless you. I have fulfilled the Lord's instructions. I'm tickled pink. It's, it's gone swimmingly well. And now the rest of the chapter is where the tragedy unfolds. And it's actually going to take two rebukes for the message to start to sink in. That Saul, where you are absolutely brimming with confidence and feeling good about what you've done for God, God sees it as a complete failure. A complete failure. Samuel rebukes Saul's idea of obedience. He says, really? You've been obedient, have you? Then what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? And the lowing or the mooing of cattle. If you've really obeyed, why do I hear animals? In verses 17 to 19, he reiterates how important this assignment had been to him. Did you not see yourself as small and insignificant and weak from the weakest clan? And God elevated you through grace and lifted up the humble and put you as king over his people. And he strictly gave you orders not to plunder. Why have you plundered that which was expressly devoted to destruction? Look at what Saul then says straight after that. Verse 20. But I did obey. I went down and did exactly what the Lord told me to do. What I did though was I tweaked it a little bit, but I still have kept the spirit of what he wanted. It hasn't got through yet. And Saul is still absolutely convinced that what I have done is right. I've kept the spirit of what God wanted me to do. And it is then that Samuel says one of the great truths of discipleship that is so true for every generation. To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed better than the fat of rams for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord and now he has rejected you as king you know here is Saul so happy full of blessing wanting to give a blessing and Samuel comes and says you're a complete failure in what you did you're like a, a warlock Divination. Rebellion is just like that. And idolatry is just like the arrogance that you have shown. Instead of being the hammer of God, you've been the grabber. And you've tweaked and fiddled and put your spin. And so you've served God, not God's way, but your way. And God doesn't want that. Saul had received clear simple instructions it can't be more simple than if it breathes it dies it's simple isn't it leave it there no plunder whatsoever you would have a sense through Samuel as you are listening as Saul that you hear God's anger against this people the Amalekites and yet still he takes it as an occasion to do a little bit of fiddling and a little bit of return interpretation of what God meant so that Saul puts it through his own filter and it becomes a this quasi obedience yet Saul has put his spin on it too folks don't you just love it when you've set something up for example at the computer or at home just the way you like things and someone's come along and fiddled and suddenly it's not like, uh, you know, you put everything out on the table and someone in their wisdom's decided to clean it all up. And I can't remember now, I had things over here and there and it's all gone. Now where's that all gone? I knew where everything was. My brother Dave's smiling, he knows exactly what I'm talking about with the sound desk sometimes. Has it cert set a certain way and someone's fiddled and now it's all not like what it was. 
As parents, don't we get a little angry when our kids hear a certain command and then they put their spin on it? And they sort of half obey because they do what you ask and reinterpret it for them. So it becomes an obedience on their terms rather than yours. If we get frustrated, no wonder God is so angry with Saul. That was devoted to destruction. That was a, a, a thing that you just don't play with there. And yet Saul tweaks the knobs, tidies things up, puts his own little spin on it, and now it becomes something on Saul's terms and not on God. And Samuel says to us, as much as he says to Saul and to me back in, back in that day, he says to me as, as, as a pastor, let alone anyone here, that God is not after our sacrifice. He is after sacrificial obedience. And there's a world of difference between the two. Because it boils down to Jesus saying, if I'm really Lord and King over your life, then our followership is about what will please Jesus. Not a followership that pleases me. You see, if we were to use today's lingo and say, Saul, how's your walk with Jesus? He'd say, oh, the Lord bless you. I've obeyed everything the Lord has asked me to do. My walk with Jesus is going fine. But what if we were to ask Jesus, how's your walk with Saul? I'm grieved that I ever made him king. He's rejected my word. I've rejected him as king. I mean, you couldn't get more chalk and cheese, could you? He asked the church at Sardis, Sardis, how's your walk with Jesus? Oh, it's a great church. We, we are just thriving. We are, And yet Jesus comes and says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And you've got a couple that are walking in white. They haven't soiled their clothes. They're walking with me. But on the whole, you're dead. And some of those churches there get a stunning rebuke. I mean, you can imagine that uh, someone is reading this letter about your church and you think you're growing gate guns with the Lord and he's saying most of it is just a write-off. Ephesus would be proud of their Bible knowledge and the way that they're sifting out to false teachers and yet Jesus says, I'm within a whisker of blowing out your candle, taking it away. Or the Laodicean church. You think you're a church that is rich and you have no need of anything, but you're poor, pitiful, wretched, naked and blind. It's Jesus' walk and his perspective with us that matters. And that's what he brings to Saul. And as I was putting this together this week, I'm starting to ask, well, where am I doing a Saul, Lord? Because it's easy for me to say, Lord, my walk with you is going okay. I think it's going well, but... Is the Holy Spirit saying, yes, Glenn, but the sheep are bleeding? You think you're being obedient, but why then? And you put yourself in this situation. Why then do you watch what you watch, not just on TV, but all the junk that's online, the pornography, the, the, the uh, YouTubes that people do that are just foul, the, the sort of language that's on, the way you talk about people on social media? The vitriol that goes on and makes people want to give up living because of the way that people talk on social media. You say you're obedient, but why are the sheep bleating when it comes to greed, when it comes to sleeping with your girlfriend or boyfriend? Why is it that there's indifference when it comes to prayerlessness or a lack of reading the scriptures or a lack of fellowshipping together? You say your walk with me is going fine. But why then do you leave certain things out of the scriptures and have no intention of doing them? We say like Saul, yep, my walk with Jesus is going well, but Jesus might bring a completely different perspective. And we need to have ears to hear. Isn't it interesting that Saul would have heard the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of the cattle? And he heard obedience, and yet when Samuel hears it, he hears something completely different. See, God doesn't need my help. The Lord Jesus did not call me to be a pastor because he needed pastors and didn't know what to do and wanted Glenn to share some good ideas with Jesus so that I could tell Jesus how his church would function so much better. 
And he didn't call you to be followers of him because he had no idea how to do ministry. What he calls us to do fundamentally is to obey, doesn't he? You see, my life and your life can be filled with so many things that I think God will appreciate and, and do and love, yet have I really obeyed and done the things that he simply said for me to do? And much of the ministry can be about me. And sure, we mightn't do a, a soul and make up a monument to ourselves, but you think of the satisfaction we can often take in that I'm doing my bit for God. But God doesn't want my bit. He wants me. And he wants that attitude of Jesus. He said, you see, uh, Christianity isn't just about sacrifice. The world loves sacrifice. And we're going to honour that next week with Anzac Day. Where people lay down their lives. And, and we honour them and rightly so. The world applauds sacrifice. And so many of our civilian honours are given to people who uh, serve the poor and serve the needy and, and do quiet caring and all sorts of things. That's wonderful. But that's not the essence of Christianity. Christianity isn't about sacrifice. It's about sacrificial obedience. Jesus did not die on the cross because he thought that that's something that God might like. He went there because it was God's will. And Hebrews 10 makes that very clear, verses 5 to 7. Where he quotes something in part like what Samuel says, that burnt offerings and sacrifices you did not want, but I am here to do your will. That was the modus operandi of Jesus. Everything was about what will please the Father. How can I be obedient to the Father? And that's why in the very next chapter here, in chapter 16, the Lord says to Samuel, stop grieving for Saul and go and anoint one of Jesse's boys. And it'll be David. A man after God's own heart. And David wrote this in one of his Psalms, Psalm 40. I delight to do your will, my God. Your law is in my heart. That's exactly all that God was asking of Saul. Let me hear that. Let me see that in action. But he didn't. It was, Lord, I delight to do your will my way. And your law is within my heart, but so also is in my heart. Just tweak a few things and reinterpret what your word says so that's something that I'm comfortable with. And the Lord didn't want that. We'd have no faith if Jesus had that attitude. He said at Gethsemane, my way might be, Lord, if there's another way out of this, that would be great. But nevertheless, your will be done. That's all that God wants. Now, we praise the Lord Jesus that we live in the new covenant where he fills us with his spirit. The spirit came upon Saul, but we are filled with his spirit. So it doesn't mean that if you're being disobedient, the Lord's going to reject you. It does mean, however, that the Holy Spirit says to us, I discipline those that I love. Are you really being obedient? Because, you know, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 3 that at the judgment for believers, there are going to be people, the motives, the things that we do are going to be revealed by fire. And some will have uh, been building with uh, gold and silver and precious stones and Others with just hay and stubble, it'll burn up and there's no reward for it. 1 Samuel 15 is hay and stubble stuff. Where I do mostly what God wants, but not expressly what he wants. That there's more of Glenn than there's more of Jesus in my walk. And that's why I say this talks to me as much as anybody. Am I really giving Jesus what he wants? Or am I playing a half-hearted game where I think my walk is okay and yet God says, no, not at all. The cure is simple, isn't it? It's repentance. And it's doing what Samuel did. It was Samuel that put Agag, the king, to death. The godly man, the man after God's own heart in this chapter was Samuel. Saul wouldn't do it because he wanted some political mileage. In 1969, Old Blue Eyes put out a song that has become synonymous with him. Frank Sinatra, what's the song? Yeah. I did it my way. He actually came to loathe it at the end of his life because that's no one else wanted any other song of his. 
other than that. But how that absolutely fits, 1 Samuel 15. I did God's will my way. And I wonder for too many Christians whether that's going to be the same. Lord, I followed you my way rather than your way. I pastored my way rather than your way. This is for everybody. And it's one of the most profoundest truths about followership is the Lord does not delight in sacrifice, but in obedience. And I ask you as much as I've asked myself this week, where are the bleeding sheep that the Lord might hear in my life? And am I really doing the things that he's asked that are pretty straightforward in Scripture? Am I tweaking? Have I got a walk with Jesus my way rather than his? I encourage you this week to let the Lord search your soul. What are the things that we need to, to put down and destroy? And not say, well, I'm just leaving that to another time or something else. No, the time is now to obey. Because that's what pleases Jesus. If he is the king that you say he is over your life, then let it show. And Saul got in the way too often and it cost him. Let's not be the same. Amen. How about we stand? We're going to finish with a prayer. Oh, Father, what a word. But we thank you. It comes from the love of a father who wants his kids to walk in the blessing of obedience, in the joyful submission. And Father, we pause and, and we know, Lord, without looking hard, that, that for most of us, the experience of Saul is one trap that we fall into as well. Lord, forgive us where our flesh wants to be rebellious and wants to say, no, I don't want to do that certain thing. Or I'll put that off till later. Or I'm mostly walking in purity with you, but I'll just allow this little bit in my life. Or we've made the excuse, well, that's just the way that I'm made, so people have to like it and lump it. Lord, we, we put up so many excuses as to why we can't obey. Father, I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and give us a heart that says, Lord, I want to obey. That I delight to do your will. For your word is in my heart. That's the spirit of David. And that was your work in him. Lord, work that attitude in us. To simply obey. And to have that disposition, Lord, how can I serve? How can I obey? How can I please you today? So that it's a walk where you can say, I'm pleased with this walk. That's what we desire. And that's what you deserve. So Lord, would you work that in each of us? As we go from here today, may the word not be snatched, Lord. May we not forget it. But Lord, may it work in us this week as we seek to be better followers of you in your power. And for your name's sake, we pray. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Go with God this week.